All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event uh, or a webinar or a webcast or an online show. Um, I'm sure there's other terms that people might use for this. It's up the, the Terminology is up for debate for some people, <laughs> um, but whatever you want to call us, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. If you are unable to watch our shows on Wednesday mornings, that's not a problem. We do post them, we do record every week and post them to our website. Um, and I'll show you that after we, um, at the end of today's show, I'll show you exactly where all of our archives are. So you can always go there and watch any of our shows. Uh, we put our recordings up there. If anybody does have a presentation of our presenters, we'll include that as well. And I do try and collect any links and URLs that are mentioned throughout a show. And so they're all collected there as well for everyone. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, book reviews, many training sessions, interviews, uh, just demos, live demos of software and different services. Um, basically, anything that's library related, we are happy to have it on the show. We also um, have uh, some sessions are done some weeks. We do have Nebraska Library Commission staff doing presentations, and sometimes we bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. On the line with us is, um, <coughs> excuse me, John Blyberg. He's um, in Connecticut. Good morning, John. Still morning for you. <laughs> it's <a> still morning. <laughs> still for another hour. And he is at Darien Library in uh, Darien, Connecticut, um, Assistant Director for Innovation and UX there specifically. And um, they've been doing a lot of really, really cool stuff, I guess, is just <laughs> a good way to describe it. Um, they're so packed. They've been working on it for years now. And this new Darien Library TV, is, as you see here. But um, John's going to take us through some of the things that they've been doing and um, how, how, it's, how it's going. So I'll just hand over to you, John, to take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to kind of share a couple things today. So thank you all for attending. And um, and uh, very <laughs> for this. Um, so Krista asked me about doing this. She kind of approached me um, uh, asking about um, an initiative called Darien Library TV that we launched about this time last year, maybe maybe in April or May, uh, but it was it was spring last year, and. It was really the first uh, step in a much broader web slash digital strategy that that we had just begun to embark on. Um, it was a culmination of it's the beginning of the culmination of several years worth of work, maybe four or five years worth of work, and also lessons that we learned when we launched SOPAC two. Which was way back in 2008, and I can't believe how that time has flown. It's just, uh, I can't believe it's 2016 already. But um, so here we are, and uh, we, so, so I, what I suggested is that, well, maybe we, I, I'd love to talk about our library TV because it was a fun project. We had a blast, um, and our users love it, and it's something kind of special. To us, and even though it's, it's very simple, it's very straightforward. Uh, it, it does represent a much larger uh, movement in terms of where we are headed. So, just to kind of zoom out a little bit, uh, Google Earth style. We, uh, you know, I mentioned our long-term digital strategy, and so we did not really know what that was for the longest time. Um, after 2008, we had we had a sense of where we were with, with SPAC 2, and we kind of rested on those laurels for about a year or so. And things started to change. The web landscape changed. Um, online sex have changed, and the way people use the internet have changed since 2008. Um, and so we kind of spent about four or five years even thinking about where we wanted to go next and sort of watching what was happening and just observing um, taking you know taking note about uh, of, of what what thing we didn't do quite right the first time around um, what our patients were saying what our staff was saying and then we wanted to think about sort of what well as a library what is the purpose of of a website what what do we do online and why you know how do we align you know these very core fundamental values that we hold as a 
contemporary with the way that we put ourselves online and even what the purpose of online presence is as a library. And finally, um, we do feel like we have a tradition of setting the bar in terms of, of these sorts of things and um, we like push our vendors and we know that um, Thing. And so we, we take our relationship with our vendors very seriously. Um, but then when we when we have certain solutions, we know that they do a lot better. And I know that vendors have on the laurels and, and essentially they will oftentimes do the bare minimum to buy in a library place that doesn't always the most of them. So what we want to do is to set the bar and say, no, you know, you guys need to step up and start doing things in a way that makes sense. And so that's hopefully where we're going to be doing this right now. And I'm going to do a little bit of a demo a little bit here and uh, hopefully get you guys excited about some of the things that, that are uh, part of that. So when we're talking about digital strategy, um, we, we kind of sit back again and, and said, all right, these are the things that we want to be a part of this. Um, and the very first thing was that we wanted to make all of this a user, do whatever we're going to do, it's going to be from a user-centric design perspective. And I know that that's easy to play, pay lip service to, um, but what we that we said this is going to be a DNA of everything that we do. So our users, you know, we we observed our users. We we sat with them. We watched how they browse through our website. We watched them browse through regular websites, not just our website. Um, we we. We grabbed statistics, um, you, know, um, you know, where people were clicking, where what they were looking at. Um, we did an incredible amount of work. Um, our U.S. librarian, Amanda Goodman, um, uh, put together an amazing report on what our users were doing and um, what they weren't doing and gave us a really um, pretty significant insight into where we needed to go. So we made some assumptions back in 2008 when we launched our website. Um, things like, well, our users are going to love reading our blogs. They're going to love reading our content, and you know that's going to be our focus. And we're going to encourage staff to write and write and write and create all this great content. And, and they did. They, they, we've we've a lot of great content over the years. But the tragedy of that was that when we looked at the statistics and we looked at the heat maps of where people were going on our website, none of it was being condemned. And, um, and that was sad. So we, we said, we said okay, that's something that we need to look at. Um, and one of the ways that, that we, we wanted to address that and Darian Library TV was sort of the first step in this, was to say, okay, well, Darian Library TV is content, right? That's library-generated content. We created that. Um, it's wonderful stuff. It's important stuff. And um, we don't want to get lost in the, the overall experience of the library website proper, quote, unquote. So we came up with this idea of creating um, discrete experience silos for different types of content. And in Darian Library TV's case, that was video content. And so when we look at Darian Library TV in just a few minutes, uh, you'll see that that is all it is. It is just a portal for our videos, it's optimized in a way that people can get to what they need to get to or want to get to, or they can browse it, and um, and that's it. So, and what that the, the benefits of that are that you can then create user interfaces that that are basically designed for the content that you're trying to create. We also um, 
decided that we we're going to have zero tolerance for quote unquote breft. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's sort of um, the junk that accumulates on your website. So all that junk in the sidebar, all those different links to places, different um, library uh, uh, services, offerings, you know, everybody wants to have a little bit of real estate on the page. Um, but what winds up happening is that it looks sort of like a Times Square billboard, like you're just overwhelmed and your eyes glaze over and it becomes just basically background noise and nobody's going to click on those things. And and the, the statistics bear this out, the numbers bear this out, that the more you have, the fewer click-throughs that you get. And again, um, the heat maps that we looked at um, confirmed this for us. So we basically um, decided that we're going to scale back and create this sort of minimalistic, very simple interface for people to get to where they're going, where they need to go um, as efficiently as possible. And then the other thing was that um, as we get into um, the rewrite of SOPAC and SOPAC 3, which we'll start show, we'll start showing you in a few minutes, um, we really kind of were looking at sort of library processes and, and how over the years these cumbersome internal processes that we have, things like um, adherence to MARC or the way that we catalog and the way that you know, that, that items uh, exist within our system, we pass that burden on users. And we've done that just sort of as a, as a matter of course because that's, those are the data structures that we have on the back end. Um, that's the way that, that catalogs have quote unquote worked. And so, of course, that's how they, you know, the front end manifests itself in terms of you know, lists of bibliographic records. Like, what? you know, that's that's you that when you make a search, right? So, um, we decided, well, that's not at all what the user wants. The user wants to find what they're looking for, and they don't care what a bibliographic record is. And um, and so, we're going to significantly and radically change the way the search results work. And that's one of the most exciting things about SOPAC 3, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. And then the other thing is that um, web technologies have changed so quickly, so rapidly, and they've come so far since 2008. Um, and in eight years, we've, we've sort of gotten way behind the eight ball, and we decided we would take a look at what was out there and um, well, keeping up with it, but, but basically we, we wanted to, to take advantage of some of the really great web technologies that are out there. And I'll go over some of those sort of superficially because I don't want to get too much depth, but just to make you aware of some of the things that we um, took into consideration. So um, and first of all, I think, I know it's overwhelming to think about web technologies and it, it can be a full-time job just to keep up with what is actually out there. Um, but I think it's important to consider that web technology does evolve for a reason. It evolves because there is a need for it to evolve. And, and that need reflects users' expectation and also user experience on the front end. So in order to achieve a particular type of experience, the technology driving that experience on, you know, in the middleware or on the back end need to evolve and, and optimize to, to kind of support what that is. At the end of the day, it's all about what the user sees on the screen, how they click through and how they interact. And so, um, as, as time has passed, tools have emerged to make that, to make those experiences easier to create. And we wanted to evolve in those technologies. Um, and we, we also acknowledge that, that that landscape became increasingly complex. And, and one of the things that has sort of emerged in the last three or four years is the split between web development and DevOps. 
And so one of the things that we had to do internally was to um, reorganize around that model and say, all right, well, we're going to split responsibility here between web development and, and DevOps. And I'll talk about what each of those means in, in just a minute. So web development, this is sort of like um, um, the, the most simplest way to kind of explain this would be web development is front end, right? This is what the user sees. And um, some of the things that, that I'm going to be talking about um, in terms of what we did with both in library TV and with the new website are frameworks. And um, we're all probably fairly familiar with CMSs or content management systems. You've probably heard of, uh, about Drupal and WordPress. Um, those are very, very common content management systems. Um, but the problem with them is that they are a complete application stack. They don't allow for a lot of flexibility. If you're going to do a website in Drupal, and you are going to do a website in Drupal the Drupal way for the lifespan of that website. If you want to create a website in WordPress, you're going to do it in WordPress. Um, and there's very little um, wiggle room between you know the way a CMS does it and say the very old school way of just creating a website using flat files, which you know it's, is totally untenable as well, and has its own set of problems. So what emerged in the interim are these web frameworks that have made sort of a compromise between the content management system and the uh, flat file paradigm. And that's sort of where we wound up setting our sites. And, and in fact, Darian Library TV is a really great example of, of how, how, it, how it drove our decision making. Um, and in fact, I'm going to flip over to it now. But we used, for, for Darian Library TV, we used a, um, a, a, a framework called Jekyll which um, falls under the MVC framework uh, model. And so basically what that stands for is model view control. And that sounds very complicated. And, um, but really, basically what it means is that um, the model, model refers to database. So if you have a database on the back end, whether it's uh, MySQL or Postgres or Microsoft SQL or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The, the model, piece in the NBC um, uh, paradigm, I guess, means that it doesn't matter what kind of database you have on the back end. The, the framework handles the connection to that database, and you actually don't even need to learn how to write SQL code. You just need to know how to use those models within your framework. And then the controller is basically all of the code that you write to say to to determine what goes, what gets sent to the view, and the view is the template. So it's basically a, a way of kind of creating, uh, it separates sort of the, the division of responsibility um, uh, among your code and makes it a lot easier to kind of create more flexible websites. So I'm going to actually drop out of um, Keynote here for just a second and switch over to Chrome. And can everybody see that? Is that? Yep, looks good. Wondering. Yep, yep, you switched okay, over. Great. No problem. <laughs> great. So I'm going to switch over to Darian Library TV. And so as you can see, this is a very, very simple site. If you go to darianlibrary.tv, this is the front page. We're not trying to market any library programs. We're not trying to get somebody to read a book. We're not trying to do anything. Um, what we have is the latest episode of um, a web series that we started called The Library. And uh, as you can see, you can browse through and there's all these different um, categories. 
And what we use for Darien Library TV is this framework called Jekyll. And Jekyll is kind of interesting because it's very close to the flat file um, model on the spectrum between flat files and content management system. Um, it actually doesn't use any models because it is totally compiled um, at once and then it's served up. What's nice is that um, you can also use it with a uh, with GitHub. So GitHub Pages is a free service that allows you to host websites on GitHub for free, which is nice. So, um, and we wanted to have Darian Library, Library TV be a uh, open source project that anybody could take. Um, and in fact, if you want to go to github.com slash Darian Library slash Darian Library TV, um, you'll see all of the files that are there um, you can download this and tweak it, and you can have your own um, TV set. Uh, you just basically push it back up to GitHub, and uh, GitHub pages will serve it for you. And to take it another step further, we also wanted to make it so that you could um, put all of your videos on YouTube and and serve them off of YouTube. So you have you literally need zero infrastructure in your library to take advantage of, of this software. Um, you just need to use YouTube and GitHub and you're off and running and that's that's what this is. Um, so let me just switch back to keynote real quick here. Oops. Okay. Oops, wrong screen. It's a little tricky to get the right screen up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, shoot. It keeps minimizing here. Um, oh, it's we can look right here. Anyway, um, I'm gonna just kind of skip around on my slides. So basically, okay, so um, um, you're not sharing the screen yet because you, you you turned off the screen sharing. Oh, okay. Let's see. So go back into the go to webinar under the screen sharing to show your slides again. There it goes. Okay. Slides. Are up. There you go. Yep. All good. Okay. Assets challenge right. and opportunity slide. That's what we see. Yep. yep perfect. <laughs> okay. So. Um, with Darien Library, we had TV. We had three elements that, that kind of came together, and first was the were the assets. So we had a, a whole bunch of unsorted videos, and they were unsorted. They were on YouTube. Some of them were on Vimeo. Some of them were on our file server, internal file servers, um, and it was just sort of a mess. And it was one of those things where you know somebody would come in and say, "Well, did you guys record that?" Um, that, that lecture with so-and-so, and we would have to go and dig through, you know, several different silos of information to try and find it, um, because we just never got our act together to create something that was going to work. So, um, so our, the first thing we did was to, to organize all of that and put it onto YouTube, put it into playlists. Um, and, and the other thing is that we had uh, we just happened to have um, a um, person on staff who was a professional filmmaker, and we thought, well, what you know, we want to we want to create this archive of content, um, but we want to kind of make something special with it and do something to kind of um, create a you know, sort of a flagship opportunity for this, uh, and also take advantage of um, the the. The skills of the professional filmmaker, um, and then we also were sort of at the end of gathering information, gathering data about where we were with regards to our digital strategy, and we thought this is a perfect opportunity to kind of prototype our concept of where we're headed, um, and 
and uh, you know create one of those discrete silos of content. Um, so we we ha we had the idea to do a web series called the library. Uh, we, well, we called it the library that would highlight different aspects of library life and sort of document what it's like to run a library in the 21st century. Um, and uh, and then also create this website, the silo for all of our other videos. And, um, and also to create something that would sort of be a gift to the people who worked in this library in this community 20, 30 years down the road. So, you know, it'll, I will be probably long gone and a lot of the people who are here will be long gone from, from this library, but it will be a window into the past, into this period of time, you know, when we, when this library, you know, opened a new building and was struggling with, you know, how to provide service at the, you know, it, it, sort of this transitional period between the the analog and digital worlds and um so that was sort of the the concept behind that and it sort of all came together to create darian library tv and that led into um the next project which was the new darianlibrary.org and um i think as i mentioned earlier we we incorporated feedback that we received from both uh, public and the staff, um, but with a with a caveat, with a, with an asterisk on the feedback from staff. So, this the feedback from staff was very specific type of feedback relating to uh, public reactions and public interactions they or interactions that they had with public, and also staff workflow in terms of how do they look things up, how do they get somebody to where they need to go. Um, and how do we put content in? Um, and then we also said, well, we're going to adhere strictly to the KISS principle, which is keep it simple, stupid. And essentially that, that means minimalist design and um, not a lot of craft, like I mentioned er er earlier. And taking the things that were hard and making them easy. Things like checking out e-content, which shouldn't be as nearly as difficult as it is. Uh, so we, we came up with things like the custom events engine, which I'll show you, um, and a simplified menu system, and SOPAC 3. So SOPAC 3 is sort of a, a separate entity, and that's sort of um, making, you know, we, what we wanted to do was to make the hard things easy. You know, we wanted to achieve one-click checkout of holds and, and checkout and holds of e-content. We wanted to integrate that into um, the account pages. And um, and the thing that I think really defines this project is um, this works engine that we've developed that really that gathers bibliographic records at the work level, presents them in a much more simplified search result, um, and gets users to the content that they need much more quickly. So I'm going to pull that up real quick. Okay, so this is our current website, and this is, this is basically, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, the SOPAC elements of this website, um, as you can see, are, you know, one of the, one of the original um, um, elements and requirements or, that, we, that we had for SOPAC was that it be integrated completely with the website. Uh, and in this case, this is integrated with Drupal. And um, if you look up here, you're not being sent off-site to catalog.darianlibrary.org or to some other um, server where you get sort of this jarring experience because whatever catalog system you're under creates is not going to be the experience that your website has. Um, and you can see this just looks dated. It looks, you know, I mean, it's it's it was okay in its time, but it's it, it's it's dated now. Um, so this is um, this is the front page, and this this is all going to change. Um, but essentially, what's important here is that this is sort of the the design aesthetic that we've gone for in the new website. 
And you can see we've sort of created a menu system that gets people where they want to go directly. Um, we don't believe in flyout menus, secondary flyout menus, which is why these menus are larger. And um, one of the, that this was a decision we made, assuming making the making this assumption that over time our users will learn this menu system and learn where things are. Um, they'll be able to hover over just these primary links and that kind of indicate where to go next. So um, one of the things we're, we're excited about is this events engine, um, which um, on the back end, I'll show you that in a minute as well. Um, but if we go back to a previous week here. Um, so basically, um, you know, we want people to be able to get through to where they're going. Um, and uh, this events engine has really been designed specifically with um, users, library users in mind. So if they click through the event, they can have the event might have multiple sessions. Um, it has built in registration and allows people to know uh, this event's been closed, but you can see, um, you know, how many people registered, how many people are on the wait list, and so on and so forth. And so, John, to, so this isn't, this is what's coming? This isn't what you, you do you have? This is what's coming. Yet? Okay. So it's not live yes. yet for your, as your site yet. Right. This okay. is not live yet. You guys are the okay. first, you guys are actually the very first people outside this library to see this. So. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> should we should we keep is it a secret i guess it's not a secret anymore <laughs> it's not a secret you guys okay. can talk about it all you want no problem um, <laughs> um so let's see if we go in here uh, in, we can um let's see so we can do things like uh, manage event registrations really easily so in this particular case um i use my kids names in here and, uh, so uh, you can take people, you can drag and drop people in and um, move people around in the registration queue. Uh, makes it very easy to do that. Um, so that, kind of, that sort of speaks to the way that we're um, trying to make things easier for um, our librarians. Um, if we go back to the website, then um, I mentioned the My Account piece and um, again, some of this is just wireframing, um, but the, we are integrate, integrating the events engine into the account page. So when people either register or RSVP to an event, they can see their um, upcoming events. You can see these are not real events. We do not do hands-on with scorpions. Um, but uh, the, this will be... <laughs> <laughs> this will be a place where they can see what their upcoming events are and they can subscribe to it in their iCal or Google Calendar or whatever. Um, and instead of um, sort of cluttering the front page of the website um, with library news, we're actually going to put it here. Um, and the reason for that is that A, nobody reads it when it's on the front of the website. Um, and, and B, the My Account page is the number one click on link. Um, on the website. So we know that, um, that this is going to get a lot of views and this, this is sort of like a, um, a, a way to kind of get news about the library website, just different, just things that are sort of like house, house cleaning type news, you know, that, that you don't really want on your, on your front page, but you need to communicate to your users. And then this part is pretty exciting. Um, and I'm going to try and do a live demo. Um, so here is um, the way we have um, uh, integrated uh, multiple um, multiple sources of content. Um, first, you can see right here, um, you can actually do, um, uh, you can actually link accounts here. So if I wanted to add, um, well, my wife, uh, I can put her in there, or um, you know, a, a child, I can put those in there, and you can actually switch between them. So if I click on James's account, um, and this is not real data, so um, <laughs> so this is uh, um, 
you know you can can see and you can kind of keep track of of um, the checkouts of other people in your family and this is really designed for families um, and also you can see your digital holds and digital checkouts um, let's see I have something on hold I believe um, so items on hold I don't have anything on hold here um, I have a novel checked out I have after you checked out to my overdrive and it'll show me there I can actually return this if I want to um, and I, or I can place it on hold. So what I'm going to do now, actually, is I'm going to go on my iPhone and pull up my 3M. Whoops. Uh, let's see now. Let's, if I can find it. <laughs> Where do I keep that? Too many apps. <laughs> Too many apps. Oh, there it is. Cloud library. Okay. So I'm going to pull up my cloud library and I'm going to try and just, I'm just going to find um, some book to check out. Um, and it's loading, loading, of course. Of course, 3M is actually moving to Biblioteca. But the, what I want to show you is that we've sort of integrated, we have multiple. Um, multiple digital library vendors and I know that that's a challenge for a lot of libraries because uh, and and we'll show you how we're dealing with this in just a minute when we move to um, the, uh, the the catalog but you your 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 ILS and your 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 catalog starts to get cluttered with all of these types of um, of digital uh, items so here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place a hold on one book and I just did that and then I am going to um, borrow another book just randomly so I just did that in the app and if I refresh this page now click digital downloads you'll see there we've checked that's that's the book I checked out. I don't even know what that book is, but um, you can see that it, it automatically updates. And then also in the holds, I placed a hold on Shantaram, and I can go ahead and cancel that because I actually don't want it. And it's gone. So um, and we make use of the the API there. And, and but the point is, I guess, that it it ties all this together, makes management of your entire um, uh, borrowing uh, activity all in one place. Uh, obviously, we're integrating fees and fines. Um, we're, we would like to integrate our Envisionware um, system with it as well so that we can keep track of, of what you've got going on there. Um, and then sort of the to kind of cap this off, we'll take a look at the catalog, which um, is still very much a work in progress. Uh, our launch date for this is, is June 1st. So you'll see sort of the, don't, you know, please pardon the dust, I guess is what they say. So I'll just do a uh, search for Fates and Furies. Pull that up. And here's where we think, um, you know, we think this is where library vendors ought to be going and, and this is the direction that that catalogs ought to be going in um, because um, if you were to search this and I'll do a side-by-side -side kind of comparison if we do a fates and furies search on our current web page this is probably similar to the type of results you would get on, on your catalog right and as a user I'm looking at this and I'm thinking what the hell like where what what am I supposed to even click on here? And I've got to go down here and if I want the book, oh, here's the book. Okay, so I'll click through here. Um, but what about all this other stuff? Like, you know, um, it's just, it, it's a mess, right? Um, so what we've done is we've basically created um, this works engine that takes all of that and um, creates work level 
um, records. And so you get just this right here, which is Fates and Furies, and then you can choose the format that you want. Because as a user, that's what we want. We want to know what type of material can I get this in and how can I get this as quickly as possible. I don't care about all of this. None of our users care about all of this and why this is all there. Um, what they want is the content. So if we kind of flip through, we can see, all right, we've got, um, and some of this is uh, a cataloging issue. Like there should only just be Bibliotheca and Overdrive. Bibliotheca is, is 3M. Um, because they just bought 3M. Um, and they should be able to just check it out right here, right here. And so they click checkout. If you're logged in, it'll be checked out to your account and you can access it on your device. If you want the audio CD, you should just click the audio CD tab, place a hold, find it in the library. And then same with e-audio. Um, so um, that's sort of the big feature that we're looking at. And um, from again, I, John, from a librarian, point of view and I'm I'll I'll put a caveat to this. I am not a cataloger, but I do watch a lot of cataloging sessions <clears throat> because of this show, of course. Is this like something along the lines of Ferber? Is that where this concept is isn't it similar concept of that? It's a similar concept, okay. but what we have found one record it, one record with all the different manifestations of it underneath there all, right. all gathered together in one one place kind of exactly. Um and that's exactly what it is. If if that worked the way that it was supposed to work. The mm -hmm. problem is that, that that the quality of cataloging does not exist for this, <laughs> for that to, for us to hang our hat on that and say, that's the, that's, that's going to be successful every time. So what we've right. had to do is. It has been a battle with, like, for a lot of librarians to make it work, to do what the, the great concept but in practice, yes. <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. right. So what we've done is we've taken that and, and we use um, like we, we use OCLC information as a first pass to, to kind of determine where these, you know, which works these should um, be kind of lumped in with. And then we do sort of uh, another pass where we have our own sort of internal algorithm that looks at other bib records and, and you know, bib records, authors, and and does the matching from there um and and so between the two we've sort of it's been fairly successful um here's an example of where we're still kind of tweaking um tweaking the algorithm so you can see we've got actually three records here and for some reason we got to figure out why that's the case um and some of it is just dirty cataloging that we get from either OCLC or Baker and Taylor or wherever it comes from um, because we do we do do main name matching and um, we look at sort of uh, Levenstein distance between the two and you know these very these very sort of technical things but um, but so we're so we're still kind of refining that and we're hoping that we'll get a, a way to kind of make that result better um, but the other thing that we will be doing is sort of creating um, a workflow for our librarians on the back end to say, you know what, this and this actually belong up here with this. And um, we're just going to make a very small notation in a 900 field somewhere. And then when, um, when we pass through on our nightly job, it'll know. All right, this is actually the works. This is this is the works that this is the work that this these bibliographic records ought to be associated with. So that is where we are, and um, that's sort of the the direction that we're headed in. Questions? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks, John. I, I didn't know if you were, had more to go. <laughs> no, not really. That's it. <laughs> no, it looks really slick. I'm really liking that the mobile connection there too. Um, pulling out your phone and seeing the things happen right there into your account. Um, that's you know, for years people have been saying mobile is well where many people are going for their main way of connecting to anything. Um, and 
I I think, yeah, you've kind of nailed it there. It's just making the connection. Um, we do have a quite one question come in. If anyone does have any questions, go ahead and type them into your GoToWebinar interface under questions. Um, I'll grab them and uh, pass them on to, to John here. Um, someone has a question. How will you be promoting events to non-users who may land on the website but never think to click on my account because they're not a card holder yet? They're just someone from the community who has you know shown up there. Do you have any special promotion ideas for, for that to getting more non-users um, figuring out how to use things on the, on the website? That's a really great question. Um, and so, and, and in fact, the website that has been designed around programming because that's, uh, you know, well, aside from the, the catalog elements, mm -hmm. um, adult and children's programming is the second most important piece of what we do, I think, after, well, I mean, you could be even argue that it's the most important thing, depending who you talk to. But in terms of the website, um, that's, you know, the website has been, design has been optimized around programming, because you're either, you're coming to the website to find out, you know, to, to find out what's in the catalog, to check something out, play something on hold, check your stuff or you're coming to figure out what can I do with my kids today or what's going on at the library. I wonder if there's something interesting going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of tertiary to that are all these other things like, you know, you know, notary services and passport services. Um, but um, so we are, we don't have a front page yet. This is all wireframe stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at how we can best float um, events, you know, upcoming events and events happening in the future, how to do that. Yeah, having um, it right there on the page, the way it looks right now, kind of brings your eye right to that, and that goes along with that heat mapping of where people look and where things go, um, that even if you're not a card holder, right there, the first thing you might see is what stuff that's happening. Right. And, 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 and decluttering, I think, is, is such a huge piece of that, that, you know, so many library websites that, that I've looked at have, you know, you know, there's so much contention for the front page that there's so much on there that everything gets lost, including oh, yeah. the, the events. And, um, and we're just not going to do that. It's going to be, that's what it's going to be. Like, you know, you've got up here, I mean, this is sort of the, the call out here. The call to action is our catalog, right? And then below that is is all events. Um, and then anything else can be can be sought after. So that's that's sort of the, the approach we're taking. We don't know if it's going to be effective enough, but we will um, keep tweaking as we go. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. It's not in stone. Once you figure out what doesn't work or some people are using it a different way, change it <laughs> exactly <laughs> make it work that way they want to yeah and someone does have a question related to that i think will you be asking users to help identify issues um as, as you're going along as you just demonstrated things that still might need tweaking so i know you said which i thought was really great you did obviously usability testing of stuff before you even started this process that's going to be something going on in the future as well Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, that's, you know, we're, we're building that whole feedback loop into the development process. And so when we launch, we will probably have some kind of widget in the corner or somewhere that basically mm -hmm. says, you know, how do you like this or, you know, you know, help us make this better or something, mm -hmm. you know, that will kind of get that information to us. Did you find um, what you were looking for? Kind of. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, something, something sort of j vague so that we can kind of get as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. um, we're also doing um, um, training for staff in April and in May, um, different types of training for, for frontline staff, um, content creators, and um, how to use the new catalog. Um, the works level stuff is a totally new paradigm that I think people are going to be a little bit sort of thrown off of you know they're, it's going to be a change for them so they're going to have to know how to do that so part of that training is also how do you ask questions that are open-ended enough that you kind of get the get the type of feedback that is really helpful um you know what page were you on what were you trying to do those sorts of things right um, and then we'll get that feedback and, and try and um, incorporate that as well 
Of course, that's that's something you always have to do. Is like you said. It, I mean, the the the. I guess it, now, like even as you said, the cliche that it, making it user centered and user centric. Yeah, <laughs> and right. keep doing that, and keep move. You know, don't just get stuck with what you went with. And you guys did a lot of good work on here and figuring out what they might be doing and want to do. But uh, no matter how much you can do ahead of time in planning, somebody's gonna do something different. <laughs> Right. <laughs> that you've never thought of and nobody realized and no no research showed you and you're like, oh well. Of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so open to change is is good, yeah. Um anybody have any other questions, go ahead and type them in. We can ask. We still got about five, ten minutes left here to go. Um we do just have a comment. Kudos to you for all of your work. Um the library user in me is applauding loudly the simplification of finding just the item I want. Oh, thank you. And yes, definitely clean websites with not a lot of stuff around it is uh, what I prefer as well, being having less to have to figure out and muddle through to find just the one thing I'm looking for. Um, too many websites are still doing that, but I'm seeing a lot of them move to that the, the bootstrap theme and um, this kind of clean theme with not fly out, fly out, fly out, all, you know, hierarchy down all the way because, you know, some people like like me. I can't control my mouse enough to do all that to get on the right, right one exactly. that I want to. And, and especially yeah. elderly people who have a real problem with mm -hmm. you know either arthritis or just they haven't grown up using a mouse. And mm -hmm. you know we take for granted oftentimes you know just the, the ability to manipulate a cursor around the screen um, because it it's just second nature to us and it's not it's for not a lot of people. people and and also when you're coming to some computer just a new computer you haven't used I know some people like I have a trackball mouse and um, not many people here at the library commission do our computer team gets very upset when they <laughs> They get frustrated, <laughs> upset, frustrated. They're like, I don't know how to use it because they use the tr traditional mouse. Mm -hmm. um, and I get frustrated when I go on a laptop that we have that has the um, the touch pads. I hate those things. I just can't seem to coordinate myself enough for them, and it does become frustrating. And this kind of thing is just it's so much easier. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned the 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 bootstrap framework because that's you know it. it I mean, this actually. Um, this site does actually use Bootstrap, um, really? and then it, oh, okay. uh, it it's not it's you know it, there's it's got a lot of stylistic style changes from mm -hmm. you know the default Bootstrap, um, but the uh, you know the emergence of sort of the twelve column layout and the and the tools the CSS tools that come along with that make development of of websites much easier mm -hmm. um, and and it's totally worth taking the time to learn those frameworks because it's going to save you um, a ton of time in the long run. Mm -hmm. And it's nice. It's, it's good to hear that you're using Bootstrap because so many, I mean, it's very nice and clean, but it's becoming really prevalent. A lot of library, a lot of websites, not just libraries everywhere are using that and they all are starting to look the same with the same basic format. Um, and uh, yeah, I just saw a thing recently. Yeah, this is the one. <laughs> <laughs> that just yep. came out, yes. Everybody, <laughs> all the websites look the same, um, but they work. But it, right. you know, it's not, exactly. this is actually kind of a funny, uh, this is a, like a little play on every website looks like this, but it's because it's, it's working for people. But it's nice to see that you took it and you that give showing yep. an example that it can be modified a bit to make it really more personal to you, to you, yep. you know, to make it look more unique from all the other ones that are using just the standard. Right, absolutely. Yeah, we didn't want it to look. We wanted to use Bootstrap, but we didn't want it to look like Bootstrap. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah. And it's nice that for those of us like myself who have never taken any or done any sort of a graphic design type education, this is shows how it can. You don't. It's okay. You can make something that looks pretty and useful and clean, and um, without you know being afraid of the fact that. But I'm not a draft graphic designer. I'm not a web designer. Or what? What what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to make my site not look not look like I'm not one? <laughs> I guess. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and there's a lot there are a lot of resources out there to kind of help. Like this is obviously a bootstrap as well, you know, like that you can see. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of resources out there, and also just kind of looking at sites that you like. Um, you know, we went to sort of this full width full width site. Um, knowing that that's sort of a uh, an emerging des design trend um, and also it just happens to be really easy to design that way 
Um, and it's also, nice you know, not have all that wasted space on the sides that be right. a lot. Yeah. Exactly. And the other nice thing is that if you're using something like Bootstrap, then you've got um, responsiveness built in. So I can resize this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see. And then, yeah. you know, you've got the menus here. And, it's still um, usable. It hasn't gone, it's still usable. become a mess <laughs> with many right. of them. Yeah. Exactly. That's so, good for people uh, with different size monitors going. Some people have the widescreen going now and some are still have the more typical, the smaller, more squarish. Yeah, and they've also done a lot of the work for um, um, backward compatibility with older browsers. Nice, like yeah. Those. And yep. also accessibility. So, you know, you can you can put in um, image tags and, and all that stuff kind of works very nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, things that you don't want to have to think about when you're designing websites, that's, there, that's all there. Right, absolutely. All right. Anybody have any other last minute questions? We just got a couple of minutes left. Um, anything desperately, urgently you need to ask John right now? I'm sure he'd be willing to answer any questions later as well if you reach out to him. <laughs> yep, anytime. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to say before we wrap it up this morning, John? Um, I don't think so. Um, again, you know, I'm always available for questions. So um, my email is john at blyberg.net. So feel free to shoot me an email anytime. I'm happy mm -hmm. to respond. Great. All right. Um, doesn't look like anybody's typed in anything right, you know, urgently at the moment. So I think we will wrap it up for today. So we're almost at the top of the hour again here at 11 a.m. So thank you so much, John. This is really cool. I really, I like, I think you had mentioned your, your Darian, um, library TV is where I first, you know, asked you about, and I had seen that it last year, a year ago that you started it. And I wrote myself a little note to I sent myself <laughs> an email reminder, give him a few months to see how this goes and then reach out to John and say, Hey, now that this has been going for a while, how's let, let's talk about how, what's, what's happened. <laughs> so, um, and I'm glad you had this, this, other, these other things that you talk about the SOPAC three and everything. They've got to see a little, uh, head, a little, uh, peek at what will be coming soon for your library website well thanks for having Very me i really slick, appreciate yeah. it all right i am going to pull back my presenter control to my screen here now if i can do this right Do -do -do. Yeah. show there we go a couple seconds to come up all right all right so thank you everyone for attending this morning um the show um, has been recorded and will be here. This is our main Encompass Live website, and we have all our upcoming shows here, but right beneath that is our archive shows. So you'll see here um, all our shows actually going back to the very beginning in 2009 when we first started all up on our YouTube, and I think this one has, yeah, we'll have the recording. This is last week's show, um, so this one will be have the recording on our YouTube channel. Um, John, I don't know if, if you wanted to, your slides, you can um, send them to me or you have somewhere else that you're posting them I can link to. Sure, I can send whichever them to you. you. Whichever you prefer. We're not picky. Um, and then I have collected in our delicious account over here um, the web the links that uh, John has been mentioning, the library site itself, the GitHub and the Jekyll, everything, the Darien Library TV. So you have those all collected together on our recordings page uh, when this is all um, done. So that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is womb literacy a parent to be program. Um, this is a great session that um, uh, I think that we got coming up here. Um, Jennifer Jordabrek, I believe I pronounced that correctly, from Iowa, just next door to us. She's got this program at their library um, helping um, parents before the baby's even born getting into reading and literacy um, to get right on top of that um, right away. So um, sign up for that next week and any of our other upcoming shows. Um, we're still working on some finalizing some plans for April so there will be some more added to this and um, hopefully very soon so you'll see some of those coming in. Also Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, please do pop over there and give us a like. I post reminders of when shows are coming up, like here this morning I posted uh, to log in uh, on the fly for people to come in today's show. When our recordings are available and ready to go, I put a post up here as well. So if you are um, big on Facebook, like us over there and um, keep up with what we are doing. Other than that, thank you very much for attending this week, and we'll see you next week on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.